different parts of the country for urban poor have been sanctioned during the phase one of the mission and contours of the second phase to be implemented during 12th plan are being worked out. Recognizing Rajiv Awas Yojana as a positive step in the direction of creating housing stocks in the country, McKinsey's Global Institute in its report titled India's Urban Awakening, Building Inclusive Cities, Sustaining Economic Growth brings out that India is capable of unleashing a wave of affordable housing stock even in a short term. Under the curative portion of the Rajiv Awas Yojana, the objective is in situ development of slums and the urban poor after conferring titles to the property. The second part of the Rajiv Awas Yojana has a wider mandate to, of prevention of slum proliferation through creation of affordable housing stock. Some states have initiated a slum free states and cities campaign and my ministry is working closely with the concerned state governments and urban local bodies to design and implement model pilot initiatives. While availability of appropriate dwelling units for the urban poor is very low due to non-visualization of this segment as an economically viable business proposition by the industry, getting the national finance to realize the dream of a decent home remains a distant dream for vast majority of poor in our society. Banks and housing finance corporations also hesitate to serve the low income sector, informal sector for variety of reasons such as lack of demonstrable credit worthiness, uncertain cash flows, etc. To make a dent on this mega deficit in housing sector, involvement of scheduled banks, housing financial institutions and refinance organizations are essential. The Government of India has been providing interest subsidy for the urban poor to make it more afford affordable and also providing credit risk coverage through recent initiative of Credit Risk Guarantee Fund to allay risk perception of banks and HFCs. In order to provide greater outreach for the housing schemes of the Government of India, my ministry has recently revised the income ceilings for qualifying under various schemes. Now the revised annual household income limit for the economically weaker section is enhanced to rupees 1 lakh from rupees 60,000 and for that of LIG lower income group it stand increase to rupees 2 lakhs from the earlier limit of rupees 1.2 lakh. Also we propose to enhance the loan ceiling with interest subsidy for loans up to rupees 5 lakhs to enhance channelization of credit in line with the pronouncement of Honorable Prime Minister of India during the Independence Day celebrations this year. This initiative will create sufficient market for the private developers to enter the arena in a big way. We are also working for inclusion of affordable housing in the list of infrastructure to provide necessary fillip to this sector. As per the census data, there has been a net addition of 26.53 million housing units during the last decade. This has been made possible because of the policy, positive policy environment created by the government through initiatives like priority sector lending policies, tax, tax incentives for individuals and firms, capital and interest subsidies, allowing FDI in housing, etc. It is demonstrated by the fact that the gross credit dis deployment by the banks in 1997 was $1.39 billion and last year 2011 at current foreign exchange rate it has increased from $1.39 billion to $666.79 billion in housing sector alone. The private sector has demonstrated also using this money its ability to create the stock to saturate the market with housing for the middle and in higher income groups of the society. However, considering the quantum of housing requirement for the poor, the sector needs to play a more proactive role in taking up housing projects for the poor and the low income group with social commitments. It makes a viable business opportunity if private players focus on the economics of scale, larger the quantity, greater will be the cost saving and better marketability. I urge the private sector to venture into this sphere in a big way. Bringing transparency in the real estate sector is another endeavor of my ministry which will go a long way in ensuring order, orderly growth of this sector. 
We have been working for the formulation of a real estate regulation and development bill after taking inputs from all the stakeholders. Availability of sustainable homes is of prime importance for building socially inclusive cities and the convention assumes special significance in this regard. What we need is development of convergence and synergy between various stakeholders. An inclusive and sustainable growth can manifest from a coordinated effort from all the stakeholders. There are no ready-made solutions or models to be adopted. It must emerge out of such conventions as we are having today. The efforts of NARITCO in conceptualizing and organizing this convention are praiseworthy. I am sure some implementable and novel ideas would emerge from this convention. I extend my best wishes to all of you and look forward to your positive contribution. I can assure that my ministry will extend total support in every endeavor to further the cause of sustainable housing which is affordable to the urban poor. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite the Honorable President Sri Pranab Mukherjee to share his vision for housing for masses. Good morning to all of you. Sri Ajay Makan, Minister of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation. Sri Nabin Rehaja, President. National Real Estate Development Council, Sri Sunil Mantri, Vice President, National Real Estate Development Council, Brigadier Rahura Singh, Director General, National Real Estate Development Council, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be here amidst you this morning for the 11th National Convention of National Real Estate Development Council. This meeting is indeed important as it will debate strategies and roadmaps for sustainable housing for the masses of our country who are facing acute shortage of this basic necessity. The pressure on housing sector can be expected to chart the northern vector in the coming decades, with the urbanization in the country growing at a fast pace. Having grown nearly 32 percent in the decade ending 2011, the urban population is expected to be around 600 million by 2030 in a century, which would see the majority of the people of the world living in cities. The urbanization in the developing world is virtually unstoppable, particularly in India, which is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. This is for this reason that countries urbanize rapidly when economic growth faster. It is attributable to factors such as industrial and service sectors concentrating in and around the urban areas due to better access to material inputs, larger <coughs> concentrations of consumers, better networking opportunities spawned by knowledge sharing, skilled manpower and globalization. All these factors would induce larger migration of people to the cities in search of new avenues of employment. With densification of economic activities in urban areas, these centers would increase in importance as focal points or hubs of economic growth. Consequently, the share of the contribution of the urban areas to India's GDP is expected to reach 75 to 80 percent by the middle of the century. Therefore, managing the challenges associated with this phenomenon is not only important for the economic prosperity of the nation, but also from the social perspective. To manage 
and wrote the benefits of the urbanization, it is imperative that we provide the basic urban infrastructure such as housing, roads, water, electricity, sewage, sanitation, transportation, education and healthcare in these city regions. <laughs>